How does copy protection work on the original PlayStation and how do mod chips get around it? When Sony created the original PlayStation, they wanted to control what games the system could play, like Nintendo did with the NES lockout chip. They wanted to enforce region locking. You could only play games from the same region that you bought the console and protect their bottom line. Only licensed developers who were paying for the privilege could make games. Piracy was also on the agenda. It had been a problem for video games developers almost as long as they'd been around. Even on the Atari 2600, bootleg cartridges were common. The PlayStation was, of course, a CD-based console, and by the mid-90s, CD burners were already on the market and getting cheaper. It wouldn't be long before CDs were as easy to duplicate as floppy disks. Sony wanted to make absolutely sure, if possible, that the only discs that would work with the PlayStation were the ones they said you could play. How did they do this? Well, they added a wobble. You see, the data on a CD is stored in a spiral track, starting from the centre of the disc and going to the outside edge. Usually this is a perfectly smooth spiral, but on PlayStation discs, the very first section of the data track has a wobble on it. It's a precisely calibrated wobble, a series of kinks that encode a simple four-letter string of text. This is a region code that marks the region that the disc was meant for. When a disc is inserted into the PlayStation, the console's firmware looks for this text string when the disc is booted. If it finds the wrong region code, or if it's not there at all, well it refuses to run the game. The clever thing is, this wobble can't be altered and it can't be reproduced on a CD burner, even today. They're just not physically capable of doing it. The only way you can make a disc with this wobble is with special industrial CD pressing equipment, something that's not so easy to come by. You can't run games from the wrong region and you can't run uh, backups of games burned onto a CDR. Well, that was the plan. Of course, it turned out there were ways around this protection. There were various methods, boot CDs, cartridges, complex tricks involving swapping a legitimate disc for another one as it was loading, but the simplest and easiest for the end user once it was installed was to use a mod chip. This was a device that could be soldered into the system's mainboard and trick the PlayStation into booting discs that it wouldn't usually boot. How does it do this? Well, it spoofs the text that the wobble is decoded into. The PlayStation's firmware doesn't look for the wobble directly, rather, it looks for the text being sent from the disk decoding circuitry. The mod chip sits on this circuit and makes sure that the right signal is sent, no matter what's on the disk. Meaning that you can boot games from any region and also boot games that are burned onto a recordable CD. Mod chips quickly became popular and certainly by the late 90s, they were readily available. And if you couldn't install it yourself, well, it wouldn't be too hard to find someone who could. In fact, in some parts of the world, mod chips were installed as standard by video game stores, and you'd have a hard time finding a PlayStation that didn't come with one already fitted. Now, if many indignant forum posters are to be believed, no one ever used a mod chip for anything unethical. No, people only ever used them for perfectly legitimate backups of their precious disc-based games that they definitely do own. But you have to admit that it is at least hypothetically possible for people to play games that they may not have actually paid for, or at least not paid Sony for, even if no one ever actually did that. So, cautious as they were, Sony and third-party companies who made games for the PlayStation were fairly keen to prevent this from happening, just in case anyone was tempted to step off the straight and narrow. And various anti-mod chip strategies were tried. The first mod chip sent out the region coding text string all the time, even when that part of the disc wasn't being read. So games could detect if they were being run on a burned CD with a mod chip by looking for this code after the initial boot and refused to work if they found it. Of course, hackers found a way around this too. Games could be packed to get rid of this protection, and later mod chips hid themselves by only putting out this text at the appropriate time. The revised model of the PlayStation, the PS1, had further copy protection. It checked not just for the wobble, but also for the boot splash screen, which was also region coded. But again, mod chips were developed that got around this feature too. There was, over time, a bit of an arms race between hackers and Sony, one which ultimately the hackers have won. By the end of the PlayStation's life, you could buy mod chips for all the different versions of the console that would work with pretty much all the games. You can still buy them cheaply today, or even make one yourself with a programmable microcontroller. And given the price that some PlayStation games are going for these days, actually backing up games that you do own probably isn't a bad idea. Of course, the original PlayStation wasn't the only console to be hacked. Sony machines in general have been very popular popular targets. And whilst the age of piracy on home consoles probably isn't quite over, security has improved dramatically, and I don't think any of the current generation of consoles will be quite as easily and comprehensively hacked as a PlayStation was. Thanks for watching. 
Thanks for getting this far, and if you'd like to see more of this kind of thing, then please subscribe.